Hello, everybody. Uh, so this week in the distribution demo, we're going to do something interesting. Uh, we had a customer recently ask about uh, running C groups within the Docker container that has the omnibus in it within Docker itself. So they're not using Kubernetes, they're not using Docker Compose, they're not using Rancher, they're not using anything, they're just literally running Docker run GitLab slash GitLab EE. Now, the trick is that they want to do memory constrained environments. They specifically want to have many small instances, and we all know that the omnibus by default will go, how much RAM and how many cores do you have? Boof. And assume it's kind of the only thing on the node. Now, we have documentation for the use of memory constrained environments. Share screen, share. In that, we talk about turning down the number of Puma, turning down the sidekick concurrency, and also particularly setting Gitalese C groups to constrain how much that uh, it will actually try and use. Now, the problem is that C groups, the control structures for this, are not exposed within the container runtime, really any container runtime on purpose. Uh, Basically, if you give access to this, you get access to a lot of things and setting the capabilities to do it the right way is not easy or straightforward in such that we actually would strongly recommend not attempting to do this in any production environment just by the sheer nature of uh, effectively the easiest way is to make it a privileged container or to give it caps uh, admin. Now, the problem is those do give you the ability to use C groups. They also give you way more abilities and C groups are only available in certain capabilities. So the idea is that we're going to try and replicate this, but try and prove out the concept of whether or not we can make use of Docker's own runtime controls. Basically, in Kubernetes, we're familiar with setting requests and limits. In this case, we're going to try and set the environment up to operate in as small a memory footprint as we can and then pass effectively those same kind of settings to the Docker run command so that this will actually impact the container. Then we need to see how well it'll actually behave, put it under some load. So the first thing I've done is I've gone ahead and pulled up this, and then we just copy and pasted this into a configuration. Obviously I've commented out the C groups uh, that if we have these present, you will get a bunch of errors and the bus will fail and the container will never start. So they're documented out. Uh, what I have done is I've set external URLs for the registry and the Rails application just so that it'll actually be reachable within a browser and intentionally set the SSH port to be what I'm going to expose on the Docker. To make this easier on myself, I basically have a shell script that will just reissue the same command so I don't have to worry about line editing and any of those joys in, in bash. It's usually not bad, but every once in a while when it gets long, it's problematic, so let's not fight with it. Um, what I have here is inside the working directory, I've set up a folder that will have etc. GitLab, another one that will have the logs, another one that will have all of the opt content, um, specifically var opt, right? So just the data generated by it. That way I can start the container over and over and over again and bypass the whole data creation problem. I, should, I say problem, but really the step, so that doesn't take as long. So I'm gonna run it with no additional items whatsoever and just see what we have here. Now, this is still the omnibus. So even though we already have all of the pre-existing data, it's going to take a little while. So let's go ahead and fire that up. So first things first, we're effectively turning Puma down to one process. 
right? There's still a couple of threads there. It's just that we don't have many worker processes that then have threads. For Sidekick, we're knocking the concurrency down. Um, our default out of box is like 50. Um, the developers actually recommend five to 10, believe it or not. And this is just knocks it down to a much more reasonable value for a memory constrained environment. We've turned off monitoring. We've specifically configured the uh, J malloc for an environment variable to set it to be a little more aggressive in memory collection. We've tuned down the Gitalik concurrency. This basically says how many requests it's going to process and or even emit in uh, literally how many they're going to do at a time or allow at a time. And then configured Gitalik in the same way, we're shoving in uh, J malloc and then configuring in that. And then we're also telling Gitalik to only ever actually spawn at most two commands to Git. This can be a delay, but it basically makes sure that we don't generate a whole bunch of processes that may eat a ton of memory. Is he trying to clear the cache? So the probable things that we're going to want to do here is for the moment, I'm going to ignore the CPU and just worry about memory. So I am looking at limiting a container's access to memory very specifically. The direct behavior is just to set memory. Now, the particular customer's target is within four or even three gigs. I don't know that we're gonna be safely able to get it down to two, just by the nature of this beast that is on the bus and all of the components that make up the application that is GitLab. What I will not be setting is kernel memory. What I might set is a memory reservation. Memory reservation is effectively a resource request, whereas memory is actually memory limit. The one thing I'm not sure about doing is the OOM kill disable. Um, if you read the documentation here, effectively what we're talking about in this instance is to quite literally tell the kernels out of memory to never touch this container's namespace. Um, so if something else is busy on the host, it will try and kill anything but this. That also actually means that if it can't kill anything else, it might kill a system process. So eh, there's a definitive implication there to say the least. One thing I'm not sure about is this swap. Uh, I don't, here. we do specifically have a discussion about swap within our documentation. And it says that we are expecting at least a giga swap. So what we could do is memory swap, set this to that, you know, one gig, and just say that this is how much swap memory you have access to. Let me get the zoom bar out of the way. Let's see if I can actually reach my instance this time. Pretty sure I set the exposed flags the right way. But it doesn't seem. Oops, I set the arguments wrong. Oh, yeah, there's that's not really what I wanted. I used dash E instead of dash P because I was thinking exposed when I typed it. That feels silly. Don't think that's going to work.
say forget. Type and one gear. Larger than the memory. Really? Yeah, I think it actually diffs them. So your swap actually ends up being the diff between your memory setting and your swap setting. Total memory and swap that can be used. Oh. I see. That's not specifically clear. There we go. Is lowercase m the right standard? Apparently it is. I guess I can do 4G as well. Okay. While that fires up, I'm looking into the GPT because I haven't run it on my machine in a while, so I apologize. Looks like these are effectively the same. Um, Malia, the Docker JSON has 10 to 50. Does that satisfy uh, testing? Yeah, yeah. This is the, the usual amount of subgroups that we're using. And the local host is just uh, for local tests to just to create smaller amount of projects and subgroups. Uh, yeah, if you switch, yeah, you can see here it will create 25 projects, five subgroups and five projects in each. And okay. in the in this, we will create 20, 250 uh, subgroups and five projects in it, or, or 10. So it will be 2,500 okay. uh, For projects. expedition, then I will just use this one. Looks like it's up. Let's try it. Hey, it's almost up. Okay, these are out of the way. Did I miss any step to actually get GPT to work? I don't think so. Well, I am up. I really don't care about that. And we're good here. All right, what is my next step? Now that I've got a JSON file. So I need to set a root group and or not use the root user. Uh, you can you can use admin user. Uh, you just can create now a, an access token and provide it to the GPT generator.
Okay, where do I stick this? If you will be using the, the Docker mm -hmm. uh, image, so you can scroll down a bit, there will be a comment, but you also will need to, uh, to set up the uh, folder structure as uh, a little bit down. Yeah, this is, is done. This is done. Okay. Uh, down, down, down. Uh, yeah, this one, Docker recommended. And below, there will be, um, below the help output, uh, there will be, yeah, this structure is needed for for the Docker to be able to, to see your local JSON file. Okay, so I need to go in here, new folder, big folder, results. So local JSON goes into here. Uh, in projects isn't, isn't needed. Yeah, sorry, uh, I was okay, too cool. slow. <laughs> Yay for simplicity. Okay, so at that point, I just need to turn it on and let it run. Yep, yep, just copy the Docker uh, run, uh, the, the comment below, below, below. Right, right. A little I'll, bit I'll do below. that in a second. I'm uh -huh. just double checking if there's anything I need to do to tell it mm -hmm. uh, the SSH port. Or will it figure that out? It should. Uh, the, the generator doesn't need SSH port because it's just uh, pushing uh, requests through the API. Okay. Uh, so it doesn't need it. Docker from the connection access. Connect. Yep. Don't have a proxy URL. And I don't need projects, right? Yep, yep. GitLab slash GitLab. Oops, GPT. Data. Sure. And I don't need to bother with the large project tarball. Yep. So that should be all should I need. Should be good. Correct? Yeah, should be good. Now, cross fingers and find out. <laughs> you need to say yes. That was fast. Connection refused. Yeah, it could be because you are running Docker and it doesn't see your Docker container. Oh, yeah, you need right. to. Um, you need to, maybe you can specify the, the the network for the Docker. Yeah, you gotta plug it into the same network. Might as well just do it, make a Docker compose for that's, it. That's not the problem. The problem is look at the host address. 127.0.0.1.nip.io. NIP.io will resolve that to 127.0.0.1. So even if it was on the same network, it's still looking at local host and not the external. So the problem is like, these are both being run on the same network because I'm running just basically on a straight up Docker command. 
The issue is that they don't actually know to talk outside themselves. Oops. Then you can, you can uh, clone the project and run it from the source, probably. Or you can just run with the network, run both with the network uh, instead of bridged into the host. So they'll run with your host stuff. I'm going to cheat. Let me go back to the JSON file. Because that port on me is exposed there. So in theory, let me make sure of that. Nope, that indeed does the connection refuse. Can we just like list the containers that are running just as a starting point? Sure. Okay. The problem is that I actually exposed it directly to 127001. Just run the second one with the network host. The second one then may actually pick up your stuff. I didn't try it with a local host. Yeah. Oh, right, because I just did that again. I didn't think about that when I fired everything off. Hey, look, we can talk. Thanks, Dimitro. And while that fires away, sorry for interrupting. Uh, the, the the generator will import the GitLab HQ, and it, it may take about twenty to thirty minutes. Oh, uh, yeah, it, it can be slow. Uh, yeah, because it's a big project, so yeah, yeah that could be an issue here. Well, that was pleasant, not. Nah. Something can... has resulted in a 502. Yeah, it, it could be because the the project tarball is very big and GitLab is just uh, completely dies, dies to import it. <laughs> uh, I, I can say, we have a, a small project um, for mm -hmm. import to test. Uh, I, I will I will find it one second. Yep. J just add the the large project tarball that I, I sent. Ah, sorry. Well, you, you will need to, ah, no, no, no. One, one second again. OK. I, I'm literally just waiting for my uh, boom to finish restarting, I guess. Hey, there we go. Well, that's one drawback we found. <laughs> you can indeed make it fall over pretty quickly if you in, in, upload a large enough item. And because there's a single Puma process, when one process dies, the whole thing goes. This is the link. So yeah, you will need to add this large project tarball option and pass the URL, uh, this URL. Can I just put that into, yep, projects. 
No, no, no. You, you don't need to do it. Uh, the the generator will download it. Itself. Okay, and it will stick it into there for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, it will uh, import it. Yeah, okay. you just. I just want to make sure I wasn't it. causing it to download more than once. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dash project dash r ball equals. You, you can ignore this. This is just a check for the GitLab HQ, and yeah, it's, it's fine that it's failing for the smaller project. Okay, so it ran successfully? Yep, yep, yep. It was imported. Okay. So that, that ran because it only had the, the five and five, right? Yep, yep. Uh, that, but maybe we, we, we will have another issue here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, because uh, the, the environment file that's been using for, for the GPT, it, um, it waits for the data, uh, GitLab HQ data. And here we will have the small project that doesn't have this data. So we'll need to tweak the, uh, the config file for, uh, for the project. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, so we may need to create the custom project file, and yeah, it may it may take a while. Uh, I, I don't have this at hand, but you can run some of the tests, like uh, the the groups related tests, uh, okay. because you you already have them. Uh, yeah. Okay. And how do I do that? I, I will. Uh, I will come. Compile the list. One second. Thank you. We have at least found one instance where we can actually just choke the poor thing. So that's kind of good. <laughs> if your upload is large enough, it will just fall over. Um, the GitLab HQ project is not small, as Nalia pointed out. Um, it's very large in its own right. So you could have issues if you were doing project imports that were, say, over a gigabyte in compressed form or possibly even that size if you're doing an outright project import. Um, that's kind of the nature of memory constraint, right? If you're extracting something and you're doing a large process in memory, and then you're then loading a bunch of data to then turn around and put into a process, you're going to have some overlap between the two. Um, one thing I will come over here and point out is that while we have in our documentation, a bunch of things. One of the things that we're not doing here is actually tuning uh, Redis or PostgreSQL for a lower memory environment. If these were to come up and recognize that my system has 32 gigs of RAM and then suddenly be surprised by the fact that only four of it's even accessible by the container, that could be a thing. I shared the, the comment. Uh... It should look like this, but I'm not sure 
uh, how many RPS do you want to do you want to run? Uh, yeah. Let's try that. Um, the idea is that we're going to try and be able to handle 25 ish users. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if okay. this is sufficient for 100, so, it should be enough. 20, 20 RPS is for 1000 users. If I remember correctly. So yeah, okay, it should be fine. Huh? Uh, no, 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 you need to uh, add this um, doc, Docker RAM GitLab performance tool. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is a, My we have different tools for this. The generator is for the data and GPT is for the test itself. That, yeah, no My bad. No As we all get to learn how the GPT works. So that one stays the same, and this one is performance tool. Yep, looks, looks fine. Now, do note that I'm on a, a four core machine. So screen sharing Zoom is eating some of my CPU. One of the reasons I specifically brought up HTOP was that we can see how much the actual container is consuming. With the data loaded, it doesn't look like we're having a whole lot of problems operating the testing which is good. It may be due to the fact that we don't have much projects and issues, like the data is not as big as we usually use for the GPT. So it may be helpful to, uh, to, to run the test, uh, to rerun the test uh, and import the GitLab HQ uh, right. data. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, I do not expect a, you know, three gig working memory and one gig of swap to be able to handle a thousand user load on GitLab HQ. So there is that. Hey, Jason, back to the actual customer mm -hmm. issue. I was trying to find in there where it, I don't see anything about where they're running Postgres. They're running so it in the container as far as I know. Gotcha. I was just curious. Yeah, they're, what their intent is to be able to spin up, uh, basically think of GitLab on demand for small project groups. They, are considering some that are able to have one joined larger instance, but there are certain segmented work components that have to be in separate instances per contract requirements. To write down to the to the database storage is what you're yeah. saying. So yeah, I did recommend, you know, if possible, you know, understand that the, the the node size for 25 is the same as 100. Uh, and there's absolutely no way to constrain that difference just because of the, the way the application works. You can basically tune the daylights out of it, but you're gonna spend a lot more in terms of tuning it down than you will to have, say, one large instance that could handle 3000 users and then having these smaller satellite instances. And then say you would have maybe 20 instances in total, one that's got, you know, a few thousand users and then, you know, 10 to however many to, to meet everybody's needs, as opposed to having literally 100 of these things. Gotcha. Thanks for that extra context.
yeah, I do apologize. Limit to what I can say. Understood. And I'm being careful as well. That's why I'm, but, but I was curious about the, the mm -hmm. customer. No, it's great context. I just, just can't say it out loud. <laughs> Internally, everybody at GitLab can see what I'm talking about. I just can't put it on the recording. Just for grins, can you pop into one of those um, containers that's running the app and, and see like if it's using swap or? Uh, sure. I'm curious like sure. how active the swap is during all this. I don't actually have any swap on my machine, so gotcha. No. Swap on minus s doesn't. Do you have that command? You misunderstand. I have no swap on my machine. I understand. That's why I was going. That command would tell you that too. Yeah. Or mount. Yeah. <laughs> There's none. That's what I'm saying. Um, also note, it is recognizing that I have 32 gigs of machine from inside the container. It doesn't recognize that it's only four gigs, despite the fact that we passed the arguments and we know that the C group is in that state. So thanks to the nature of C groups, technically, do I have each stop? Uh, nope. Okay. I can at least see who's doing what and how much. I'm guessing this bundle is Puma. You can hit C, it will show you the full command. Yeah. That's yeah, humming right along on the CPU, isn't it? Everything else is pretty idle. Yeah, this is not a huge surprise. I mean, we're we're basically running GBT that hits the API and the, the renderers for the views and all this, most of the heavy lifting is handled inside of Puma. So there's no surprise to me that it's the thing that's eating all the CPU. Um, that being said, as Nolly pointed out, we, we didn't exactly load it down with data. We gave it a small project and then we only created a number of things in terms of uh, total data on the system. So it's not like we created 250 or 2,500 groups. We really only created you know, a total of 25 projects. It seems to be doing fine though. Yeah, I'm curious if your your earlier import of uh, GitLab HQ, if that uh, just hit the out of memory killer, being that your system doesn't have swap. Uh, yeah. Often, depending how slow your swap is, but often swap is more of a like a uh, deterrent to the out of memory killer in that it slows everything down. <laughs> right. Okay, here we are. And yeah, we did get some that actually did fail. So API v4 groups actually failed on the testing. Uh, the target was greater than 16, we managed that. Uh, 500 milliseconds uh, and it, it, it passed on one, one second. Yeah, that, that, that where, where it's failed. Yeah. 
repeat now, that? I'm not I'm not sure I caught so that exactly. Here's what happened. The, the time to first byte P90 is supposed to be less than one half of a second. It was taking more than one second. So mm -hmm. yeah, essentially there was more requests than Ruby could actually respond to. Gotcha, so it started swatting them away. Some of them got swatted, in, yes. Uh, but for the most part, it did get to them. It just took too long to get there. Um, workhorse here isn't tweaked to be like, yeah, I've, I've hit my API limit, go away. It's actually Workhorse is queuing it, and then Puma is just getting to it as fast as it can. Um, and since out of the box, you're going to get a couple of threads and not one thread per CPU or anything like this, you've got one process with probably two children, and you can only respond to so many so fast. So Yeah, I get, I get that, yeah. Right. Um, so that's that's the nature of the fact that we're literally running, what is it, 60-20? Uh, so if we dropped the RPS to, say, 10, it'd be different. Um, however, I don't think there's a lower one, is there? We have a lower, like five, oh, right there. And two, ten, yeah. Let's try this. The thirty with two. Uh, let's try twenty with ten. Let's see how well it holds up to that. So it's doing its thing. There is some cache involved. I mean, and I am going in and intentionally navigating around, creating additional load, just to show you like what's actually happening when I start navigating around the load result from this and my just single extra browser popping around. Pretty snappy overall, right? Just it looks like, like that here. It's relatively snappy. Um, as someone who's accustomed to navigating on that on an empty instance, yeah. It's working. I know which things are actually going to cause you know further CPU load, which things have additional database queries and, and things like this. You have anything? There's it doesn't have much data, yeah. We're just using it to test uh, GPT generator in the in the CI. Yeah, quickly. Had to wait an hour for right. get up and get board. So you can see here that that actually ten RPS was fine. I mean, not just fine, but really fine. Twenty RPS was apparently just too much. Let's see what's the next one we can hit. Two hundred is not going to survive. Let's try 2020. Tests.
And you can see going from 10 RPS to 20 RPS has a significant impact on load time. So there's an instance of where tuning could help depending on how many um, threads you're willing to have, right? Now, mind you, Ruby's threading is a little bit different than the way that, uh, say, Golang does it. It's not a subroutine. It's not a, a Lambda. And you can't have necessarily two threads actually operating at the same time. So there's only so high you can make that thread response. But having more than two would probably be better. At the same time, 10 of them won't do you much good in a single process. Gotcha. So striking that balance between threads and processes is what you want to do. Right. And this is something that we, we've learned slowly over time is where that balance it actually should be. Right. Do we configure the number of cores that we pass into that container? I missed that part. No. In this one, we actually did not. OK. Because it's picking up four cores, and I'm not sure, like in customers' case, whether it's that's the constraint as well, because that will further limit things. Like looking the at the role. hasn't specified yet. Okay. You're right in the observation, though, in that we don't specify it, so the omnibus is doing its default magic, right? So it's going, how many cores do I have? Okay, then give me 90% of all cores rounded to make processes for. It. And what we have done is set, specifically set Puma worker process to zero, which means it spawns up one single process and doesn't spawn up children. Um, I don't think we do thread count based on that. So if anything here, we're just saying that's, that's all that there is. There may be further tuning. I don't remember all of it off the top of my head. There is some. Uh, in what you can actually do there. What we could do is actually say two, but the problem is when we say two, we now have doubled the memory consumption of Puma, uh, just by the nature of spawning yet another Ruby container. So there's you know a gig and a half of RAM gone. Yeah, because what from what you were showing in H top and top uh, that you are reaching that threshold on the load where you were past the four cores that the system is showing that as seeing four cores, you're above four loads. So he was stressing out slightly at that point. And your test just shown that we failed as soon as we crossed that. Okay. So let me run that again. Let's see where we cross that. Now I'm gonna let this run in the background. And I've got the top from inside the container and the H top from my local system. Noting that you know we're sitting at 50-ish percent just because I have Zoom running and I'm sharing my screen. But it's a good example of noisy neighbor, right? You have, if you run 10 copies of GitLab side by side on a 32 core machine, you know, how much are they gonna fight? It looks like it's not crossing it anymore with that plus one user. When you were clicking in the browser, oh, there you go.
utilise pas. The zoom bar is causing me problems. Okay. Well, we managed to get it to fail again at that same threshold mark. So 20 RPS in this scenario with, with some noisy neighbor going on. Mind you, right now it's just Zoom and you know the Google Doc that are really doing anything. Okay, well, I don't think we actually ran into memory issues other than the gigantic import, but we did definitely find out that you get about 50-ish maybe users, maybe 100 into this scenario without too much of an issue, but you will at least start to notice some slowdown under extremely heavy loads. I'll say extremely heavy loads in a noisy neighbor environment, which probably will be this customer's particular behavior. Go ahead and stop the share. The memory constraints did work. At least that much we know. And it didn't fall over, but this is definitely one of those scenarios where we're going to have to try and make sure that we're you know testing this from time to time on how do we actually operate in a single environment in a highly constrained behavior in in certain things it's not something we normally test awesome demo very informative lots of uh, container internals and whatnot happening in there yeah, if anybody's interested in the specifics of how and why C groups do or don't work and, and the underlying of why they're not normally exposed, if you go to the linked issues and follow to the documentation that are coming from that, you'll find out why these are not things that are exposed inside of containers and, and why, even though that's a great way to contain a process, doing so inside of a container requires a lot of privileges that you just normally don't get for good reason. Capsis admin bad. <laughs> yeah. Just give it root. Uh, how about not? Yeah. So I will, since this is the end of the demo, I'll go ahead and give Demetra that the heads up. No, not all demos are supposed to be pretty shiny and perfect. This demo is intentionally to walk through something, demo what the product is and how it behaves and actually understand the problem that we're trying to look at. Not necessarily that everything is all shiny and perfect and look at my product. Those are product demos. That's not what we do. So it's more of a work session really. That's yes. not to say if you have something polished that you finished, we do from time to time, um, particularly if it's something that doesn't, wouldn't normally get the exposure but we yep. want people to, to know about it. So there's room for uh, interpretation on the demo sort of based on what the team's working on. This was an interesting one because it kind of, you know, it came in hot from a customer. Um, Jason was able to pretty quickly identify like what needed to happen. And so it makes a nice, makes a nice uh, demo because it's super current and relevant. Actually, I think that demo should be going into handbook, like into the documentation now for anybody setting up their own instance. And that's that small. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the thing is that the, the notes that will be present in the demo, 
documentation will be things that we can then feed back into the actual proper documentation. Like, by the way, this works when you install it as the package. When you're doing it as the container, you need to take these things into consideration, right? Because our auto magic thread and our ability of Postgres to automatically configure how much of its buffer it should be using in memory. Like it, Postgres should have recognized that, oh, I can't allocate a gig and a half for my shared memory buffer hmm. <laughs> and done something about it. But do we know? Have we tested it? Should we write it down? Right? There's a number of things like this. We, we do a lot of auto magic behaviors when you install the omnibus on an actual node. However, as we've seen and as called out here in Docker, you see the CPUs of the host and you see the memory of the host, right? If I went to the system monitoring tools, it showed you the system load as it understood it. It didn't show you the extra load from the processes outside of the container because it can't see them, but it did show you the overall memory availability, right? It showed you all 32 gigs and that's not true for that container. It's only four at most. And three of it's actually usable, right? Because because I don't have squat. Yeah, yeah, that's the typical actually issue with running things inside of containers. You actually get to see the entire system, and you have to be careful where you pick up your data. Right. Okay. If there's no other questions or interesting points. Uh, then shall we call it a day? Sounds good. Thanks again.